this first poem is called Of Whom Am I Afraid? I was feeling a little at loose ends, so I went to the farmer's supply store and just strolled up and down the aisles, examining the merchandise, none of which was of any use to me, but the feed sacks and seeds had a calming effect on me. At some point, there was an old grizzled farmer standing, standing next to me holding a rake, and I said to him, Have you ever read much Emily Dickinson? <laughs> sure, he said. I reckon I've read all of her poems at least a dozen times. She's a real pistol. <laughs> and I've even gotten into several fights about them with some of my neighbors. One guy said she was too prissy for him. And I said, hell, she's tougher than you'll ever be. When I finished with him, I made him sit down and read the complete poems over again, all 1,775 of them. He finally said, you're right, Clyde. She's tougher than I'll ever be. And he was crying like a baby when he said that. Clyde slapped my cheek and headed toward the counter with his new rake. I, buy, I bought some ice tongs, which made me surprisingly happy, and for which I had no earthly use. <clears throat> this is called A Sound Like Distant Thunder. I had fallen asleep on the couch with the TV on. Every now and then I would open an eye and see someone get stabbed or eaten by a monster. Once a beautiful woman was taking off her blouse, and then the phone rang. I couldn't tell if it was a TV phone or my own. I sat up half asleep and reached for the phone. Howie, a woman's voice said, is that you? You sound like you were asleep. I was, I said. I wasn't Howie. <laughs> but I was in the mood to talk to this woman. <laughs> Howie, I miss you. I wish I were in bed with you right now, she said. I miss you too. <laughs> I, wish, I wish you were here with me right now, I said. I hated not knowing her name, <laughs> and I didn't know if I could call her honey or sweetie or any other endearment. Why don't you come over right now, I said. Oh, you know I'm in Australia. <laughs> and my work here won't be done for another month. It's just hell being away from you this long, she said. I love you, I said. I think I meant it. <laughs> you mean the world to me, Howie. I couldn't get through this without knowing you love me. I think of you all the time. I look at your picture every chance I get. It's what gives me strength. That and our brief phone calls. Now go back to sleep and dream of me. Dream of me kissing you and holding you. I have to go now. I love you, Howie, she said and hung up. And though my state may be described as a gladdened stupor, I felt like Howie. I really did, and I believe in my heart that the nameless, fameless one indentured in Australia really loved me and that my great love for her gave her strength. I cozied up on the couch and fell into a sweet sleep. But then I heard a lion roar, and I feared for both of our lives. Howie, she cried, save me. But I couldn't. I was busy elsewhere, tying my shoe. <laughs> this is called The Animists. At the motel, the man said... This is a Christian motel. I've got to see your marriage license. <laughs> marriage license, I said. We don't drive around with our mar marriage license. 
I don't even know where it is, but it sure isn't in the car. Then you can't stay here. We don't allow heathens, he said. Heathens, I said. You're calling us heathens? The world's full of them, he said. Whether, whether you're among them, I don't know, but I don't take chances. And how do we know you're not some kind of child molester or axe murderer, Melissa said. I was proud of her. <laughs> Show him your tits, I said. Melissa lifted up her sweater and showed him her God-given natural endowment. The old man gawked and stammered, You, you appear to be Christian. (laughs) Nope, she said. The left one's an animist, and the right one is too private to even discuss religion. (laughs) But my guess is that she's an animist, too. I like animus, he said. I love animus. They're my favorite. We turned and headed for the door. Dirty old man, I said. You're right, he said. I am a dirty old Christian man. I didn't know that. Thank you, and come back any time. <laughs> this is called the rally. There was some kind of rally going on in the common. Somebody was speaking into a bullhorn to about 300 people who were cheering and shouting things. I decided to drift over and check it out. The speaker was saying, Even my three-year-old son knows better than to kick a goat. I mingled with the crowd. A woman yelled, You got a great big cherry pie on your head. And a dozen others said, Yes, you do. The man continued, And then the dog ate our sofa. Did we kick it? No, we didn't. Someone shouted, The saints... Drop the ball on that one. The man said, I've been down there where even the little birdies fear to roam. I once found an angry viper in my pocket, but I steered the course. I bonged myself with a hidden cloud. And you never lost the way, Minnie shrieked. I was working my way toward the front. The excitement was catching. (laughs) If you spit at a burning skillet, it sizzles, and then it's gone. And what have you got? You have the memory of the sizzle, but soon that's gone too, and you're poorer than you ever were before, he said. (laughs) Your duck just sat on a firecracker, I cheered. (laughs) The speaker stopped and tried to locate the man who had spoken those words. The crowd, too, was looking around. I acted as though I were looking around also. After a considerable pause, he continued, Never before have we witnessed hairy hands with long fingernails curl before the puffballs of history with such miraculous dexterity. The people went crazy. They started bumping one another's foreheads. I was bumping and getting bumped. It was no accident I swallowed an ant this morning while preparing my remarks for this rally. I wanted to swallow that ant, he said. People had stopped bumping, and now many of them were wiping away tears. I had to admit, he was a powerful speaker. (laughs) And now we are on the verge of setting sail, and the little headache and the big headache, too, and we can see the fireflies who had all but forgotten us beating their wings like idiot children coming back from a dull day in the park, and it is beautiful. Can't you see how marvelous it is? He said. We love the idiot children, someone shouted. Fireflies can't drive tractors, another yelled. What happened to the pig, I said. The man next to me looked disgusted. There is no pig, he said. (laughs) 
That's a hard one to read. I always feel like I'm going slightly insane. <laughs> this is called Silver Queen. I pulled my car over by the farm stand on Northwest Street. How's the corn this year, I asked the farmer. It's the best ever, he said. You say that every year, I said. No, I don't. Yes, you do. I said, no, I don't, he said. Yes, you do, I said. I don't, he said. Well, you do, I said. But let's not make a federal case of it, I said. Fair enough, he said. What kind you got, I asked. Silver Queen, he said. That's not Silver Queen, I said. I know Silver Queen when I see it, and that's not Silver Queen. Mister, I've been growing corn for 45 years. I know every damn thing there is about growing corn. I can grow corn in my sleep. I can grow corn before I was growing corn before you were born, and I'll probably keep growing corn after I die, he said. <laughs> if you could stand apart with a dozen ears of, that, of your beautiful silver queen, I'd be much obliged, I said. That night, the kids all said, this is the best ever. And I agreed. The next day, I was driving down Northwest Street again, and I stopped at the stand and got out and said to the farmer, Please forgive me for doubting you. It's some terrible flaw in me. You were right. It was the best ever. My children thank you. My wife thanks you. And I thank you more than I can ever say, I said. I forgive you, my wife. I forgive you. My wife forgives you, and the corn forgives you, he said, sweeping his arm back toward his fields. Oh, yes, I said, the corn, the corn. <laughs> this is called The Rules. A man came into the store and said, I'd like to have two steaks, about 10 inches each, Half an inch thick, please, I said. Excuse me, he said. I said, this is a candy store. <laughs> we don't have steaks. He said, and I'd like to have two potatoes and a bunch of asparagus. I said, I'm sorry, this is a candy store, sir. That's all we carry. He said, I don't mind waiting. It could, be, it could be many years, I said. <laughs> I have plenty of time, he said. And while he was waiting, a woman came in and said, Where is your hat section? I'm hoping you have a large red hat with a feather. I'm awfully sorry, but this is a candy store, I said. We don't carry hats. I'd like to see it nonetheless, she said. It might just fit me. We only carry candy, I said. It might just fit me anyway, she said. If you'd like to wear a piece of candy on your head, I could possibly find something in red, I said. <laughs> that would be lovely, she said. And then another man came in and pulled out a gun. Give me all your money, he said. I said, I'm sorry, this is a candy store. <laughs> we don't do hold-ups. But I have a gun, he said. Yes, I can see that, sir, but it doesn't work in here. This is a candy store, I said. He looked at the man and woman standing in the corner. What about them? Can I hold them up? He said. Oh, no, I'm afraid not. They're covered under the candy store protection plan, even though technically they don't know it's a candy store, I said. <laughs> well, at least... Well, at least I knew you were a candy store. I don't just, I just didn't know there were all these special rules. Can I at least have some jelly beans? I'll pay for them. Don't worry, he said. And as I was getting his jelly beans, another man walked in with a gun. This is a stick-up, he said. Give me all your cash. The first thief said, this is a candy store, you fool. They don't do stick-ups. What do you mean they don't do stick-ups, the thief said. 
It's against the rules, the first one said. I've never read the rule book. I didn't know there was one, the second one said. Would you like some chocolate kisses or perhaps some peanut brittle, I said, hoping to avert a squabble. He replaced the gun into his shoulder holster and scanned the the glass cases thoughtfully. A half a dozen chocolate-covered cherries would make me a very happy man, he said. That's what candy stores are for, I said. The two thieves left together, munching their candy and chatting about a mutual friend. And that's when Bonina Sinnott and Halasa Delphin came in. Halasa was wearing a large red hat with a feather in it. The woman in the corner left. That's it. That's the very hat I want, she said. Yanking the hat off Halasa's head, Halasa grabbed the lady's arm and threw her to the floor, retrieving her hat. Bonita ordered a bag of malted milk balls. The man in the corner helped the woman to her feet. That's my hat, she whispered to him. She's wearing my hat. Halasa invited me to have dinner with them, and I said, great. Um, I'll close with a poem called, um, well, wait a minute, what what am I going to close with? I've inadvertently accumulated some uh, holiday poems, I notice. I've got two Christmas poems and an Easter poem. (laughs) Soon be doing some greeting cards, I think. Get you know, get some real money at last. <laughs> I'll read a poem called uh, "The Special Guest." Down the chimney came Old Saint Nick, which was weird because it was noon on a hot July day. (laughs) He was covered in soot. Well, this is quite a surprise, I said. You should get that thing cleaned, he said. We weren't expecting you this time of year, I said. You wouldn't happen to have a beer, would you, he said. It's so hot in this suit, you wouldn't believe it. Sure, I can get you a beer, I said. When I returned, he said, Where the hell am I anyway? I told him, and he looked confused. Do you know what day it is, he said. I told him, and he looked bewildered. He took a long slug of beer. I hate to admit it, but I'm not really sure what year it is, he said. I told him, and he thought about that for a long time. Can I have another beer, he said. When I returned, he said, Why am I dressed like this? It's hot out there. You live in the North Pole. You're only supposed to come down here at Christmas, I said. Oh, he said, Mrs. Kloss died. I'm lonely up there. I want to live down here in a nice little house like this one. Do you have any money, some savings, perhaps, I said. I'm broke, he said. I gave it all away. I have nothing. You could get a job, I said. I'm too old, and besides, I don't know how to do anything, he said. We have a spare room now that the kids have gone, I said. You could live here and help out with odd jobs. He looked around. Can I have another beer, he said. (laughs) I got it for him. I just want to get out of these old clothes and shave this damn beard. It's too hot. He really did look miserable. Well, you can borrow my razor and maybe we can get to the mall, I said. Maybe we can get some summer clothes at Mr. Big's. I'm just skin and bones, he said. There's no meat on me. I haven't eaten in months, maybe years, I don't know, he said. 
Well, then, maybe some of my clothes might fit you, I said. I'd like that, he said. I'd like to be able to walk down the street without people making such a fuss. After another beer, Nick shaved and tried on one of my shirts and a pair of cotton slacks. He was a gaunt old man who stayed in his room most of the time. He seemed to not remember his old life at the pole. So Jill, so Jill and I never mentioned it. He liked to rake leaves in the fall. I don't know why. Jill knitted him a sweater, and he cried when she gave it to him. Then he kissed her, and I said, that's enough. <laughs> Thank you.